Good evening, everybody. Public Act 100-0640 amends the Open Meetings Act to expressly authorize public bodies to meet remotely in certain circumstances without the otherwise required quorum present at the meeting place. This law requires that the head of the public body determine that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent because of a disaster. So Joe as board president will make that determination once the meeting is called to order. At least one member of the public body or the chief administrative officer or the chief legal officer must be present at the meeting place unless it isn't feasible because of the disaster. And I am here at the library this evening. We will do a roll call after the meeting is called to order and all votes will be by roll call. As with all open meetings, we provide space for public comments in accordance with the law. For purposes of this virtual meeting, we've asked for the public to submit their comments by email or voice message and I will read them a lot at the appropriate time. The meeting will be recorded and will be available on the library's website for 30 days and will be archived in our administrative offices thereafter. It's all yours, Joe. Okay, hey, thank you, Michaela. Good evening, uh, board members. Good evening, guests. I'd like to call this meeting of the Aurora Public Library District. Board of Library Trustees to order at 6.02 p.m. Suzanne, if you could please call the roll. Ryan Citrin. Present. Joe Filipek. Present. Paul Latour. Present. Sandeep Blonde. Present. Matthew Orr. Present. Melinda Riddick. Present. And Suzanne Stegman, present. Thank you, Suzanne. That establishes quorum. Uh, the Aurora Public Library District Board of Library Trustee find, Trustees finds an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent at this time uh, because of the ongoing public health emergency and believes it is in the library's best interest to hold a virtual meeting to perform our essential business. So with that, uh, moving on, additions, cha additions, changes to the agenda. Do we have any changes to the agenda this evening? I haven't received any requests. Okay. Moving on then to approval of minutes from our December 15th. Um, we'll start by asking for a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the December 15th, 2021 regular meeting. Motion. Second. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Melinda. Are there any changes um, or amendments to those minutes? Okay, hearing none, may I again, Suzanne, have a uh, roll call vote for approval of those minutes? Ryan Citrin? Yes. Joe Filipek? Yes. Paul Latour? Yes. Sandeep Blonde? Yes. Matthew Orr? Yes. Melinda Riddick? Yes. Suzanne Stegeman? Yes. Okay, thank you everyone. Motion carries. Uh, moving on, we have another set of minutes here from our January 6th meeting. Again, may I have a motion and second to approve the minutes of the January 6th, 2022 special meeting. Motion. Second. <laughs> Thank you both. Any changes to those minutes as presented? Okay, hearing none, Suzanne, could you do a roll call vote, please? Ryan Citrin? Yes. Joe Filipek? Yes. Paul Latour? Yes. Sandeep Blonde? Yes. Matthew Orr? Yes. Melinda Riddick? Yes. Suzanne Stegeman, yes. Okay, thank you. Motion carries and those minutes are approved. Uh, moving on to item six, we have staff and committee reports. First up, we have the director's report with Michaela. Thank you. Um, in an update to what's in your packet, uh, I wanted to let you know that the program team has decided to go hybrid in February for public programs to give this latest uh, surge a little more time to subside. 
What this means in practical terms is that children's programming will continue to be virtual or take home. Most teen and adult programs will also be virtual, but a few will be in person. Examples being the seed swap, um, which is happening at all locations on February 5th, if we have any gardeners in the room, and some makerspace programming that can't readily um, go virtual. I'm also pleased to announce that we have hired a finance manager, Mark Salem. Mark comes to us with a very strong background in finance and accounting. His most recent position is with Becker University. He starts February 14th, and so you'll meet him at your February meeting. And finally, I wanted to let you know that we have been doing background work with Studio GC, even though we can't do any in-person focus groups as we had hoped we would be doing in January. So we're helping them collect the information they need about our facilities, and we are preparing for those in-person groups once it begins to make sense. Um, Rick McCarthy from Studio GC thinks probably March at this point. And so more to come on that just as soon as I have it. And um, that's all I have for you. If you have any questions or concerns for me, I'd be happy to hear them. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Michaela. So any questions on uh, what Michaela just gave us? Her written report is also on page uh, six of your board packet. Congratulations on um, finding a suitable candidate. Um, and I look forward to meeting Mark. Thank you. I think he's going to be great. Good. Yes, good news indeed. I would also just point out um, in the COVID support section and mention of the vaccination clinic, I know some, I know at least Paul and maybe some others, Michaela was there at the legislative meetup mm -hmm. on Monday where Steph, uh, where Representative Kifowitz spoke about her you know, gratitude and, and um, you know, was really happy that she was able to, to work with the library on this, uh, on this project. So it was really great, great to hear that. What? Okay, hearing no other questions at this time, we can move on to the foundation report with Laura. Hi everyone, thank you, Joe. Uh, the foundation board of directors met on Monday to review our 2021 results and to discuss our plans for 2022. Um, I'll give you a snapshot of 2021. Um, our major gift, personal visits, direct mail, social media, and website uh, raised a little over 101,000 in 20, 2021. Cruising through the decades netted 50,000. Uh, Lace Up for Literacy netted a little over 10,000. And then other efforts like grants, Giving Tuesday, matching gifts, uh, we raised 25,000. Um, and I want to thank you all for your support as well. Really, really um, appreciate it. We next then really took a look at where is the campaign in total to date? As you may know, we started uh, the new Bookmobile campaign in 2019. And then we didn't continue with the campaign in 2020. And then we uh, restarted in 2021. So to date, we have raised $360,470 towards the new bookmobile, and our goal is $438,000. So that leaves us a little over $77,000 uh, to raise in 2022. And as you may know, we talk a lot about, you know, the miles. Um, so that means, you guys, we have 28,200 miles uh, to fund in 20. 22. So um, we're pretty excited about that. Um, it's it's kind of, not, you know, we're just invigorated knowing the new bookmobile will be delivered this year and there'll be, you know, a lot of activity around that um, as well. So with that said, I just uh, want to share with you our goals, uh, our fundraising goals. We did put the new bookmobile at 100,000. There could be some unexpected um, expenses and that sort of thing. Um, then we really are going to focus in on creating a book, new bookmobile endowment. Uh, we really wanna be there for the library when maintenance needs come up, whether those are routine or down the road needed. And we have a goal in 2022 of starting with a minimum of 20,000. Uh, we'll have to keep growing that before it can really be of support to the library, but that's our starting goal. 
we're going to continue with literacy packets for our vulnerable children. And uh, we've placed a goal of 20,000 uh, to do that for this year. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with light of learning scholarships, but this is where the foundation helps township residents who have some financial challenges to be able to get a library card for their household. And we put 10,000 in our budget for that. And then we also have a program where staff can fill out a form and uh, the foundation board will review it for different funding needs that the library may have throughout the year. And we put 15,000 in our budget for that. So here's how we plan on raising those dollars. We're, we're gonna uh, seek more grants. Uh, we're going to be uh, working with uh, schools. We have um, three of them that we're going to pilot a fundraising program with. Uh, really, I'm meeting uh, with a teacher tomorrow from Simmons to get that up and off the ground there. Um, we're going to continue with the community because the bookmobile is all about community. So we have um, some things uh, prepared for that uh, that we're excited about. Events, we're gonna do the Dueling Piano event again in 2022. And we think, but we're still, uh, the board is still uh, cogitating on the virtual 5K. Uh, we did see a dip in participation for the 5K, yet the sponsorship was strong. So they're in the evaluation process. And we will continue our, what we call personal visits with uh, donors where we meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. Now I went through that kind of fast, so I hope I was clear, uh, but is there anything I could answer for you? For the 5K, uh, this is Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> um, for the, hi. For the 5K, is, have you thought about um, doing like a hybrid thing where some of it, you know, some people could be in person and some virtual? On Monday, they did discuss that. And uh, we know with our kind of size of board and staff that we want to have one really signature event. So they're kind of toying with, you know, um, how can we make this happen? So um, thank you. I'll pass that on. But they are looking at that. Um, okay. Yeah, because I've seen a lot, uh, not a lot, but I know that this past, I guess, fall, a lot of them started converting to kind of hybrid things that had been um, virtual only in 2021 and 2020. Yes. So, so thank you. Okay. Hey, Anybody? Laura. I'd Hi, like Matthew. to. I'd like to add that I think it is a wonderful idea that we're adding twenty thousand dollars to a fund to uh, you know set aside just you know to look after the bookmobile. I mean, even though we buy something brand new and our hopes are you know to have no uh, problems whatsoever that often may not be the case. And as things arise, maintenance costs, you know, come down the line, as long as we're paying it forward, you know, we can look at uh, getting the best life out of the, you know, future bookmobile that we'll be getting. So I am thank very thankful for that. Thank you, appreciate that. Laura, how do people, um, how do people learn about the Light of Learning scholarships that are available? Um, hi, Suzanne. We work with the township and we have materials done in conjunction with them. Uh, so they get the word out in their newsletters and, and that sort of thing. But really a main way we also um, uh, distribute those are when people come in to get a library card and they're a township resident and um, you all know what it takes per household um, as you approve that amount. And, and sometimes, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, you know, that that's a little out of reach for us. And our staff are awesome. They're all trained uh, with the light of learning our circulation staff. And so they then um, can speak to them about that. And we're, we ask our township residents just if they're using the free lunch program or on the, the link program, you know, we, we want to make it possible for them to have a library card. So. That's our process. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Well, it's very nice seeing you. And I know I went through this rather quickly. I'll give you an update a couple months down the road, but do not hesitate to let me know, call, email, uh, if you have any questions or need any clarification. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. Okay, next we have the Policy and Personnel Committee report with uh, Paul. Do you have a, a report from the Policy Committee, Paul? Yes, I do. So we met on January 18th to discuss the proposed, it's easy for me to say, succession plan and revisions to the confidentiality of library, library records policy. Um, you know, I'll just, I'll defer discussion of the succession, succession plan <laughs> to the regular agenda. Um, we'll talk a little, a little bit later. As far as the confidentiality of library records policy goes, the committee needs a little more time to think and discuss. Uh, so we'll bring that to you guys at a, at a later meeting. And that is, that's pretty much a wrap up for that. And then uh, like I said, I'll, under new business, I can uh, go into the more details on the succession plan. Paul, do you have a sense of when the, the policy personnel committee will circle back and, and meet to discuss that policy again? I would I'd imagine in February. Okay. Yeah, we, we haven't discussed directly, but I think we should, I think this deserve you know, to get it done, um, I'd want to meet in February. Okay. Okay, thank you for that update. And as you said, we'll talk about the succession plan on that agenda item. Um, that is the end of our uh, staff and committee reports. Moving on to public comments. Michaela, do we have any uh, public comments that were submitted uh, to you? We do. Okay. All right. Good evening, board members. I'm Ken Van Andel, West Branch user, third floor chaperone, and unable to appear before you in person. Pause for applause. Smiley <laughs> face. I'd like to briefly comment on three topics. Like many of you, I am disappointed that you can't, that you again cannot meet in person. I miss the informal off the record one-on-one -on -one conversations before and after the meetings. That said, I want to applaud and second the decision by Michaela and Tom and know it is certainly the right thing to do given the current COVID surge. Well done. As to Paul's committee discussion on the succession issue, I wanted to remind everyone how fortunate you are to have Brenda on staff as a professional HR expert. Most libraries do not have an in-house authority, such an in-house authority to call upon. In addition, you have Jamie waiting in the wings should a larger personnel crisis occur. Be thankful. Finally, given that committee meetings often conflict with the city council sessions broadcast via Zoom, May I offer a simple thank you to Miriam and her staff for providing a video link on your Facebook page so that we patrons can later view the discussions here at home. Surprise, no complaints. Give yourselves and the staff a Navy, bravo, Zulu. Keep up the good work. Sincerely, Ken. Hey, thank you, Michaela, and Ken, wherever you are this evening. Any <laughs> other public comments, Michaela? That's all. All right. Okay, moving into new business then, uh, we have the approval of December and January uh, bills. Obviously, we don't have a Shelby yet, a uh, finance manager to introduce us. So, Michaela, lucky you. <laughs> um, we did have a few questions on the bills, and so I'll address those first. Um, we had a question about the Bridge All Libraries payment. So you guys, you remember, this is the company that um, provides our collection HQ software, our, our inventory management. So this, um, this is two things. So 18,250 is the annual subscription fee and the rest is an online ordering platform that's also provided by the same company. So that 18,250 uh, is a reissued check so that was that was the question. So it was in your in your December packet too. We had to reissue the check because there was a typo in the address line. Um, there was a question about the Midwest tape expenditure of fourteen thousand five hundred, and that is the vendor that provides our audiobooks and DVDs. We just had a very large order there. Um, we are working on Kim and I are working on a list of vendor reference list, and we'll have something um, up on your SharePoint um, next week probably. Um, and then there was a question about the $10,500 expenditure for Tyler Technologies. And Melinda, I was mistaken when I emailed you about this earlier. 
that that particular expenditure is related to the conversion project for our time and attendance software. So we are using, um, we're using one version of Executime, we are moving to another version. Um, so those are the questions I had on the bills. There were a couple of other things I wanted to just point out to you. Um, you'll notice that the amount we're asking you to approve is higher than you're used to seeing. And that's because there happen to be three payrolls in this reporting period. Um, sometimes that just happens. And there were a few other large expenditures that I wanted to mention to you. Um, one is $15,000 to rails. And Rails um, organizes group discounts from particular vendors for us. And so 12,000 of that is for Press Reader, which is our digital magazine subscription. And 3,000 of that is the software that allows us to book appointments for curbside and drive-through services. And your next packet, you will probably see a refund from Rails <laughs> because um, there was an adjustment to the price on one of those products. There was a $14,000 expenditure to Patron Point, and you've heard me talk about Patron Point a lot um, as the online registration customer communication uh, platform that we've um, recently moved to. And then just in broader terms, looking at our income statements, at the end of December, we were halfway through our fiscal year and we're roughly at 50% expended. Um, we're right on track overall. And so I'm happy to try to answer any other questions that you might have. One question, Michaela, on the revenue side. Mm -hmm. um, on page, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't send this ahead of time, but I think, so under grants, we, you know, we had budgeted roughly like 290,000 and I see our year to date is like 330,000. So, mm -hmm. So this, the grant, is that figure only reflecting the per capita grant or are, is there other, um, are there other grants that feed into that dollar amount? And if you can't answer this off the top of your head, totally fine to follow up. I am pretty sure that our grant, uh, that the money that we put in for the grants was only uh, for the per capita grant this year. However, we did appropriate considerably more. So right. um, um, we're, we're okay as far as expending the grant money. Okay. Okay. Other questions um, on the December, January bills for Michaela? Okay, hearing none, may I have a motion and a second to approve the monthly bills in the amount of 1,190,000. $582.41. I'll motion. Paul? I'll second. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Um, if no further questions, Suzanne, if you could please call the roll. All right. Ryan Citrin? Yes. Joe Filipek? Yes. Paul Latour? Yes. Sandeep Lande? Yes. Matthew Orr? Yes. Melinda Riddick? Yes. Suzanne Stegeman? Yes. Okay, motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Moving on next is um, Paul. what Paul alluded to before, uh, the succession and continuity plan. Uh, Paul, if you want to introduce this. All right, I can do that. If I can say a succession consistently. <laughs> uh, so the succession and continuity plan is here to help us as a board to have some comfort and confidence in the administration of the library in the event of a transition. It's going to be either short term or long term. Um, it will help also help us meet the standards laid out in serving our public 4.0. The chapter on governance suggests that we have a written succession plan. And this only covers the executive director position, since that is the only position that we are directly responsible for. Um, and it covers contingent, contingency. Boy, there's a lot of words here that I'm stumbling over tonight. <laughs> it covers contingencies for temporary and permanent absences, planned and unplanned. Um, 
we're lucky in that we have a deputy director and a director of neighborhood services, both of whom are experienced and well qualified to keep the library running for any length of time. Um, that, yes. And Michaela is developing an internal document to help ease any, any transition so that any acting director would have the information they need to manage. Um, so that would be very helpful um, in that instance. So, um, and we'd like to have a conversation about the policy tonight to make sure that it does what it's intended to do. And then we will make changes and adjustments and bring it back for approval next month. So just a discussion tonight on this. Um, and it's a little different from the way we handled policies in the past, but we wanted to make sure you all have plenty of time for consideration and input since it is a, a pretty big, uh, important policy. And I think that's about it on that. So. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'd start, Michaela, is there anything else you want to add um, or any, you know, it's obviously you would have done work on this, the development of this. Um, if not, that's fine, but I just wanted to start there and then I'd open up to any board members who. Thanks. I'll just say that um, we had a really great discussion about this at the Policy and Personnel Committee uh, meeting. And, um, you know, I, I just want this to be a useful document to you as a group. This is one of those things you can amend this at any time. Um, we're not, you know, we're not implementing this because we're expecting any transitions, you know, we're just doing this to meet the standard. <clears throat> I have no plans to go anywhere. I'll be here as long as you'll have me. Um, and um, also just wanna point out um, as uh, our public commenter pointed out that we are really lucky that we have Brenda here to help uh, to help you through any, any transition um, permanent or temporary should it happen. So um, I, I'm just interested to hear what people have to say if their thoughts about the policy, if it, if it is helpful, if there's th things we need to add or things we need to leave out. Kella, I have one question. Um, the term temporary, do we want to define that in any way? You know, we talked about that at the committee, on the committee level too. And I think, Paul, if I remember what we just, what we thought about at the committee was that, you know, we wanted to hear what the board had to say. Certainly there are policies out there that define it as a certain amount of time. Um, or, you know, or more or less three months is, is what we often see, um, you know, but they don't all. And I think um, sometimes what we think is a temporary absence becomes a permanent one. So um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts and preferences were about that. Yeah, and if I could just, just mm -hmm. piggyback off of what you're saying, um, that's kind of where I was with that too, was that, I, I think I, we were, when we were discussing it, I had said, I don't think we need to get locked into a exact amount of time because there's circumstances that might, it just depends on circumstances a lot of times. So I think um, defining it as somewhat like, like I said, like three months is a, is a kind of a guideline, but I wouldn't want to do anything too specific. Yeah, I don't know that I'd want to get any more specific either. Um, I think my only thought was, um, I believe the policy is uh, basically between the executive director and the uh, board president um, is where that authority lies with any decision process there. And I'm wondering if we should just put a some perhaps time limit where the full board needs to get engaged. So yeah, we did not get into that part of it, but I, um, yeah, I don't know. What are the other? What do you? What do you others think? Were you going to say something, Matt? Sorry, I wasn't. Okay. Um, yeah, I. You know, Ryan, I think it's a. I think it's a good observation. And, and you know, if you kind of, um, if you were to project a, you know, this board or a future board, um, 
needing to sort of interface with this document in the event of uh, temporary absence in this case. I, you know, I could see that leading to the question of like, is do we consider this a, a temporary absence? And so I don't know, I, I, as I think about it, I, I could see, I'm wondering if there is um, a way that we could add some sort of uh, description or uh, definition of, def of temporary that maybe is not, um, you know, less than this many days, not more than this many, but at least sort of a it's sort of a general sort of time frame just to say what we mean by temporary so that, you know, a week versus three months is sort of like, it, it, it would give the board at least a little guidance in terms of definition. Um, and I guess I'd be curious if, if there are other succession plans that we've looked at, if there's, if we have any examples of an effort to sort of define that mm -hmm. meaning. Uh, Brenda, is the, um, is, is it defined in a, in any library policy in, in like the LOA policy in terms of, you know, what's considered, is it just something, you know, every so many weeks it has to be renewed or anything like that? Not really. And when you look at something like FMLA, that's, even though FMLA only lasts you know, 12 weeks, um, you really don't want to define that as a certain end period too, because there are certain reasons we would extend it. Right. So, you know, <clears throat> I've been thinking about this too. I'm like, how do you, how would you define that? You, you, you would tie it to like a leave, but our leaves all have an option in them to extend them if we, if we need to. And, you know, sometimes somebody might be on an FMLA and they're getting close to that 12 weeks and they just need a week more or a month more. And you're, you know, they're coming back. So you just mm -hmm. extend it because it's, they're close. Right. So, um, and it's really hard to prescribe that too. Most um, advice that we've always gotten is it, it just, everything is depending on that circumstance. Mm -hmm. So the type of leave matters, I think, you know, intermittent versus a full leave or accessibility of that person. I think there's a lot of things that play in here. Um, so I, it's hard. It's a challenge to think about how to define that. You know, we could say something like anticipated to be three months or less, you know, something that gives yeah. a little wiggle room, um, but also gives a little guidance if the people making this call are not the people that are in this meeting. <laughs> I think, so, Mikhail, I think we, we kind of talked about this topic about the succession versus continuity, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think what you're talking about here, the short term is the continuity aspect, not the succession. Right. Right. Succession is something which uh, takes the executive director out of question. It's the... Mm -hmm president of the, the board and the board of directors and all of those people, Brenda and everybody else kind of getting involved in the succession. But as continuity is something that the executive director uh, himself or herself would be planning for it, right? Because kind of you, in this case, you, when you go on a, as we were talking about, you go on a three month kind of vacation to Europe, you would plan for continuity with Tom and kind of whoever else is going to take over, right? So for that, I think it is your discretion to kind of provide that guidance and continuity, and which is what we're talking about. How do you have the procedures and policies documented so that the mm -hmm. continuity can be handed off very easily to whoever is going to take over from you for the shorter duration? So that's, I think, from an organizational execution standpoint, it's your call. Mm -hmm. not the board of directors call in a sense, right? Because you want to continue the organization, you're not leaving the organization. And, and the board of director really have a significant role in case of succession. I can imagine um, a temporary absence though that isn't planned or anticipated, you know, an mm -hmm. accident or-, or Yeah, sure, yeah. That's under, yeah, that, that last, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so. Yeah. But those couldn't be, I mean, those, I mean, those are not planned, they're not driven by um, kind of a duration consideration. Mm -hmm. They are driven by the criticality, right? Because if, let's say, hypothetically, whoever is in the role kind of meets an accident, 
or, or falls sick and is away. So either it's a, you are not going to wait for three month duration to wait for that thing to kick in. The moment you realize that this is a critical incident, you're going to kick in the continuity aspect. So again, we are talking about last time as well. We talked about that disaster recovery continuity aspect. Yep. So whenever you rec- realize that this event has happened, that's going to lead to some discontinuity. You're going to kick in the continuity uh, policy. Mm-hmm. Well, any of the the other um, other board members that haven't spoken to this yet, is do you have a um, any thoughts one way or the other in terms of any sort of time frame language being included or not in that section? Hey, Joe. Uh, personally, I think adding a time frame is just, you know. It's difficult because, you know, you know, we have an idea of what a temporary uh, situation would be, but, you know, to limit, you know, the time frame of what that would be. I mean, we, we kind of have a gauge, but, you know, how are we to say, you know, what, what, what do we say is temporary? You know, if someone, you know, gets hurt, you know, and they're like 12 weeks to 15 weeks, you know, is it around the time frame of, you know, that that 12 week mark? But, you know, you don't want to put a, you know definitive you know mark on it to say hey it's 12 weeks you know if you're you're going to be back in 16 well sorry we we have to cut it at 12 so i i I just i i don't feel good with adding a like a specific you know restraint on on the time if that makes any sense Any other comments um, about that, or I, you know, certainly any other um, any other parts of this document? What do we think about putting some guardrails on the time frame for full board involvement? I hadn't thought about that previously, but I think it makes sense. I mean, I think it is a is and should be a full board um, decision after a you know. But again, it always comes down to well, what are we gonna? What is the appropriate time frame? And you know, there there is no answer. It's just kind of coming on something that that seems reasonable. Right. Um, yeah. I almost. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was uh, just gonna say we do have a, a there is a provision in your bylaws where. Um, a special meeting can be called sort of by acclamation, you know, if, mm-hmm. um, you know, a, a simple majority can, can call a meeting. Um, uh, but the, the board president can also call a meeting at any um, time. So. so Michaela, I'm just curious if they were to do that and we write something in for full board involvement, do they operate on a opens meetings like regulation, they would vote on what the appropriate time frame is and that kind of thing to set the action in motion? Well, they could, um, they could, or they would uh, have a special meeting, go into closed session, discuss how to dispose of my body or whatever. And then, um... <laughs> this Sorry, is such a pleasant topic. I know Michaela to be talking about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> I was thinking that it actually. I, I mean, I think it kind of is easier to put a time frame on this than it was than it is because it it's not up. To, it's not necessarily as amb- ambiguous as something, some an injury or you know, like you just don't know how long it's going to take a person to heal or or recover from sickness. But if it goes like three months, we can be like, well, that's long enough that the board should really be mm-hmm. getting more involved. You know, it's my thought, but at the same time, we also want to move quickly on it. We don't want it to be uh-huh. sitting with, you know, waiting to, to make those decisions because Tom or whoever will need to be active in that, um, in that role. So I don't know. I don't think I helped anything there, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> kind of went back and forth, <laughs> but that's where I'm thinking anyway. 
So. I think in terms of moving quickly, I think the verbiage and the existing policy makes sense because it's really up to the board president. Um, and so I don't think that there's a timing issue there. So I think that that's an important um, issue, Paul. I don't, I don't think that we have that issue currently because the way it's worded, I think we've got that covered. I think the only concern is over um, an extended period of time. Um, at what point do we bring, um, maybe we're, uh, something like after say three months that there's a um, not not necessarily a board action but a report to the full board and that could be an executive session if necessary something like that yeah that's actually what I was trying what I was starting out to say was like at that juncture of three months that that's when the board would meet so yeah I was wrong in saying Tom or whoever would already be in that in that role for three months so it wouldn't be that necessarily that quickly but I would still want to make sure we didn't have it too you know waiting too long but um yeah so i kind of got got mixed up there on the on the thing but yeah i agree with what you're saying ryan so ryan and paul i think are you saying that this is kind of the the temporary absence uh, potentially after three months or so is leading to the succession planning effort now because now we have come to realization in what in that situation that the executive director is no longer going to be coming back and we need to start executing for the succession plan. I don't think it's necessarily intending to go in that direction necessarily. Um, it's simply after you know a fixed period of time that the, the board is brought into a discussion about it. Um, and it could be just a matter of uh, continuity of the uh, you know like extending the temporary absence, whether you know, let's say it's the three-month mark, for example. Okay, and, okay. And then you know the board is brought up to speed on whatever the issue is. And then we can decide, okay, you know, this is acceptable to the full board um, and that we don't need to revisit this for say another three months due to the circumstances as, as they've, you know, unfolded. Yeah. So, so in other words, what you're saying that, let's say in, when you kick in the continuity planning, let's say the executive director something happened and then Tom has to take over the responsibility. At that time, I think the board should be informed. So obviously right? so that, that's the one event. And then potentially kind of, this should be revisited and reviewed periodically until the succession planning kicks in or the executive director comes back, right? So that the review cycle, what you're looking at, is it going to be monthly? Did the, every board meeting every month we review and that particular topic until that kind of sort of closes down either by kicking off the succession planning effort or the executive director coming back and, and the who has taken over that particular responsibility during the continuity phase, kind of stepping back into and going back to their original role. So that so, could be, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, I, I don't know that it makes sense for it to be monthly initially, Sandeep, maybe mm -hmm. after a period of, of three months, um, and the reason I say that is because it's protected by law for the first three months anyway, right? And so I don't know that it, would a conversation even be uh, uh, appropriate, you know, at that point, but perhaps uh, monthly following that or something like that yeah. or regular basis, whatever you, you, don't, you might not even have to define that. But I think the, the idea is that what, if I'm correct, Ryan, that you're saying um, that that at, at a three month period is when that initial when the board would be brought in rather than just conversations with with Joe and with the president. Is that is that understanding correct? Yeah, I think that's basically what I was saying. Um, just a month, just a check in at a certain fixed point in the future from the start of the event and then whatever we want to do after that point. Um, but if we say, you know, three, four months, I think it's a significant amount of time to be without the executive director. And I think that the board just needs to, I think, be aware, um, you know, brought up to speed at that point and, and discuss if there's any decision point, whether it's a, a longer absence or whether it's, you know, what, what action might be necessary. Yeah. I think just to clarify it, what I'm saying that, because when this thing will happen, wouldn't that become an agenda item on a, during a monthly 
meeting that the board will have. You know, and in, if it becomes, I, I'll just sorry. say that in practice, you know, with um, when the, when I was the deputy director under the previous director and she was ill, I I did in practice give almost a monthly report. So. Yeah, that, that was just saying that that's a standard practice for our governance. Yeah. Right. If something is going on until that gets resolved, it'll be part of the agenda item on a regular basis. You may not do anything about it, but it get informed about it. Yeah. And you say this continues on the situation or you say kind of it's a situation that we need a, a next level of escalation. And we'll take now the succession planning or something else as an activity that the board takes on. So I don't see board will be not informed for three months or any duration. Right. It'll, they will be. It'll continue to be part of the agenda item until the situation either comes back to normal or uh, a next course of action is taken up. Any other thoughts on that item or other parts of this plan? I'll give an easier one. I think in the second sentence of temporary, uh, temporary absence section, I think I see practicable, which should be practical, I assume. Practicable. Sounds nice, but I don't know that. <laughs> um, well, so I, I, I think that, I mean, this is one of these, and, you know, this is, I've almost, when I first read this, was thinking, is this really, is this a policy or what is it? Because it, it I mean, we call it a, a plan in the title of the document. It really, um, I mean, really from a practical standpoint, it is when Michaela emails me on Monday from Maui, I won the Powerball. <laughs> what do you do? I mean, this really does, um, it tends to happen in smaller libraries. And I've gotten those phone calls in my day job from a board president who all of a sudden the director's gone and they don't like, who's going to pay everybody, you know, all those questions. And you're right. I mean, we are fortunate to have Tom and Brenda and Heather and, you know, all those people that like know what to do in that situation. Um, we have not had a, I mean, Michaela, am I right that we have not had a, a document like this? I mean, have we ever, or, I mean, not since I've been on the board, right? No. Not that I, not that I've ever found. And I think a lot of libraries, um, because this was incorporated into those standards, mm -hmm. a lot of libraries are starting anew, and this is kind of their first experience. Mm -hmm. So I, as all to say, I don't think that we need to, um, you know, rush through this. It, it, mm -hmm. Is there enough from this conversation that the, um, you know, staff and policy committee could could maybe take a stab at at that? the section on temporary and as you said some some sort of loose time frames that might just provide a little more guidance than, than what is in there now is that a reasonable you know from my point of view yes i think we've got some good things here and i think you know just like you say joe thinking about you know what other libraries go through sometimes um where boards are not always in accord or you know, where board and staff are not always in accord, I think it's good to have some, some guidance in here. And then, um, as, you know, as far as the policy uh, question goes, I mean, if you, if you adopt it, it's, it's, it's the board's policy, you know, no matter whether we call it a plan or a policy or whatever. So um, just like the employee handbook is, is, is your policy, <laughs> even though yeah. it's not called that. Right. Um, so um, I, I don't know, Paul, if you want to weigh in, but I, I think we've got some good, um, good, good things to, to think about and talk about here. Yeah, I agree. And I think that there's wording in it already to, it, you know, like, like I said, this is the first that we're doing this. Uh -huh. other, there's not really a lot of other libraries that we can turn to to see how they've done it. And we've got writing in there that says that we can amend this whenever uh -huh. we need to. So it's not like this is going to be locked in place for 10 years or something like that. We can't make any changes to it. So um, I think there's 
we've got some good things to add to it. Um, but, you know, I don't know that we need to make sure like every possible contingency. I don't even, I don't know how I'm saying that. So I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs> Having a rough night. <laughs> Okay. Any other comments? Otherwise, I guess we will just um, yeah, appreciate the, the discussion and thought on this. Um, I guess we will just perhaps revisit this at our next meeting, possibly approve, um, and we'll maybe have some updated language that we can look at for February's meeting. Yeah. Okay with everybody? Yep. And that's, that's what I was planning on, you know, that, that our committee was planning on that we would go back in February and, and, uh, with the discussion points from tonight and present something for the February meeting. Okay. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thank you policy committee for working on this and staff and uh, we'll be back at it in February. Uh, next up we have the database update and um, Tom is gonna talk to us a bit about um, what was shared in our board packet related to use and, and cost analysis and so forth. So um, Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Joe. And thanks everybody for allowing me to present on this tonight. Um, following that, I just want to say, Michaela, please cross the parking lot very carefully tonight. Go to the speed <laughs> limit. Don't, you know, go in any gas stations and buy a lot of ticket. Um, so. And I think, I think Tom, we did talk about that you and Michaela should not walk together. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you two should not be anywhere together in public, or uh, you, you just keep separated. <laughs> We're okay. Heather's at home today, so it's yeah. all good. <laughs> oh, good. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so in all seriousness, I'm glad to talk to you guys about database usage and uh, kind of cost per usage. That's the report that we built today. I'm going to have Miriam just share that. Thank you, Miriam. Um, that bio just so we can reference it, if that's okay. I also want to say thanks to Himantu Trivedi. He's our digital services manager who really helped me put this report together. I'll also thank Heather because she does a really good job of making sure our IPLAR stuff and stats are in order. And that's what built those two middle columns here in this report. So database sessions 2020 and database sessions of 2021. Um, you see the number of sessions um, that were kind of used each year. And on the way left-hand side, you see the name of the database. Um, the second column to uh, from the left is the cost per year. Thank you. And then the second column from the way right is cost per usage. So um, that cost per year divided by a session. And then the way right is just a very brief description of the database. If you don't you know, understand what that means, feel free to holler anytime and, and ask any questions. Um, I'm happy to, to get your interest in this presentation, but I just wanted to talk about this a little bit and give you some more context. So um, again, we, we get these usage reports from if our IPLAR stats, which is the Illinois Public Library annual report um, reporting that we do every year per the Illinois State Library guidelines. Um, and we use the IPLAR definition of database usage as our kind of guideline for when we count these statistics. And they, they define you know, database usage as, and I'm gonna read this, the number of full content units or descriptive records examined, downloaded, or otherwise supplied to user from online libra, uh, library resources that require user authentication, but do not have a circulation period. So that's a mouthful. And the problem with this definition is that it can't quite accommodate the differences of in variety, scope, and function of all the different databases we offer and how a session might be counted for two databases that are very different in nature. Um, so to make more sense of that, I was going to give a few examples. One is that you know many databases produce a session from a simple search that might take a minute. Like if I were looking up a business in Aurora and A to Z databases, that would be a session and that took one minute. 
But if you compare that with um, another kind of search in a database such as LinkedIn Learning or Learning Express, which are these powerful online video-based learning platforms where I might be in a course for an hour or two, that is a session. So that's the time spent in the session isn't reflected in these statistics too. So um, just wanted to point that out. Another example might be um, to clarify the kind of apples to oranges nature of comparing these databases is if someone to, were to search for a read-alike for a book that they just read and loved in our database novelist, that would produce a session, you know, a list of books that are, are read-alikes for that book. Now, if we compare that with a session that could be produced by like a one to two hour foundation directory online search, which that's in the candid uh, database over there on the left, this is for grant seekers and research being done for normally nonprofits who are trying to find out more about not only um, organizations that fund grants, who the grant was awarded to in the past, um, other details around the grant, and if, if a a uh, nonprofit in Aurora searched that with our the help of our business librarian that we have here. That could be one session to that that read alike search in Novelist, and the weight just doesn't quite compute there. Um, so I wanted to just just mention that, call attention to it. The other thing you see here, we have um, a number of databases, but we're always pretty thoughtful about making sure we're meeting audience needs with a variety here and there's very little overlap. One thing that we do every year um, is we give staff, supervisors, managers, frontline staff, the opportunity for Try It Illinois, which is uh, like a two month period where we can try lots of different databases that we might not subscribe to and see, hey, is this something that would really meet an audience need? And we get that input and it kind of informs us when we make subscription decisions. Um, and we also get a lot of manager input. And, you know, it, we normally look at usage too. So this was a helpful exercise for me uh, too, to, to look at this uh, report. So moving on, I was just gonna highlight a few kind of interesting databases. I will say they're all, they're all interesting. That's the reason we subscribe to them. Um, but a few that I wanted to point out, uh, Ancestry is the first one listed there. It's a very helpful tool for family history research, and it's available only in the library. Um, but, but here it's supported by our community history librarian, as well as enhanced by our local history room and collections. And there's only a few, like two or three databases that are only available in library. And oftentimes these are databases where an on-staff expert really can help customers navigate the resource to uh, its full impact. Um, a few others, BrainFuse, uh, just a little bit further down the list. It's an excellent resource for students. It offers live virtual online tutors. Um, these tutors go through a stringent vetting process. And so that's pretty powerful, an online virtual tutor for students. Um, this was you know, heavily uh, shared with our school community during virtual learning. And you know when kids couldn't come around or meet with a if it was dangerous to meet with an in-person tutor, um, you know we were able to kind of leverage this, and it gets good use. I'll also mention the Chicago Tribune and Historical Chicago Tribune. That's a high cost there, but this allows for full text searching of digitized articles from 1849 to the present, and so multiple users, the the powerful search of functionality. Um, so it's not just like uh, you get a newspaper thrown at the library's front door. No, you get uh, a newspaper for all those years every day and you can search. So that's the high cost and it really is helpful um, for research. And then the last one I'll just point out is LinkedIn Learning Library. Um, these are video-based tutorials and courses that cover everything from technology to learning, uh, leadership to personal growth. And you'll notice that there's that high usage in 2020 and part of this was that, you know, our community was at home. Our staff was at home too. And we really tried to give opportunities for our staff to continue to professionally grow by accessing this database. Um, and I, I know for, for me personally, I used it a few times uh, over the pandemic to try and, and learn some new tech skills. 
even as we move to um, heavily using Microsoft Teams, this is a resource that helped us get there. Any questions or comments or suggestions or, or points of interest so far before I move on? I don't have much more, but I wanted to talk about industry benchmarking a little bit and just some cost stuff. Just a quick one on the LinkedIn learning. Do you think that the numbers for 2021 are more reflective of like a normal normal year or is it still something that's, you know, like you said, 2020 was such an a, a anomaly that, so I'm just curious if you know back to like 2019 or um, how much that was. And I know it used to be lynda.com or whatever. So I, I don't know if that changes to like usage or whatever, but. I'm not sure, Paul. I, I know it's a really helpful product and there's um there's times it supports staff and there's times where also it's it's really going to be helpful for customers uh especially as we think about more virtual learning opportunities i can look into that and see if we could kind of compare to 2019 yeah and that's something you know i'm just curious about because like you said i'd like to have an idea of how how that the this year's numbers would fit into the overall picture you know what, I we Himansu just messaged me saying that we had about four to five hundred um, uses per month. Um, sorry, per I think four to five hundred per year in 2019. So I'll double check that and get back to you to see okay. where that looks. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Tom, I think I thought oh. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Melinda. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, so with these databases, I know you're showing the cost per year, but do we charge a fee for people that use those databases? No, they're, they're, they're free to okay. everyone to use. Um, you know, if they're using it from home, sometimes they have to make a free account. Um, and oftentimes their library card gives them access and that's how, you know, people kind of access the resource, but it's free to them to use. Okay. Tom, my overall thought was the database sessions, if they're representative of one user per session, sort of, I think that perhaps is a reasonable assumption, right? I thought given the, uh, the number of people who use library, uh, this seems lower end and maybe as kind of wondering whether people know about these tools and databases uh, because these are very valuable resources, yeah. right? So is it because some people know and then not many people know about it? So can, any thoughts on that? I can share some thoughts. I, I know others on the call might have thoughts too. Um, one thing I think of is, uh, are the years 2020 and the year 2021 as being anomalies in themselves. You know, our normal ways of marketing some of these databases or bringing awareness about them to the community, some of them have been altered. So just for an example, I know when we do school outreach, oftentimes we will really let them know about some of these powerful tools available to them to help them in their education. Mm -hmm. So if those, if those, if those are opportunities shrink where our staff are not able to go into the school as much as we would like to, we need to pivot and figure out how to way, you know, to do that. And we have been thinking about video based, like outreach sessions where we can share with schools, but some of this is just the strangeness of the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think that there's opportunity also with programming to be, to, to be honest, I, I think about Creative Bug. Um, we just purchased and started that in uh, July of this year. And it's it supports makers and DIYers with video-based tutorials on how to do specific projects. And we have a makerspace. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I feel like there's mm -hmm. a lot we'll of bring opportunity. Them together, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can hook them with a program and then off they go to, to use this pro a product on their own at their home, you know? So I think that's that's a part of it. Um, so I think there's more opportunity for us to explore in a number of ways. I'm happy to hear from others though on that. I, 
I also want to add, um, in addition to what Tom's saying, is that's something that we recognize within our marketing plan that was lacking a lot. So we're seeing where we group them and intentionally um, picking three to four databases to highlight every month um, and kind of mm-hmm. rotating them to keep them up, 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 you know, um, in in people's um, mind. Um, as Tom said as well, with programs, um, I know with Creative Bug, for example, uh, Digital Services was planning on doing a program on how do you uh, bring together the the uh, the cricket that's available now at West Branch and also incorporate that with Creative Bug. And we also are teaching programmers on how do you market these databases that we have at your programs themselves. So if you have the audience already there, how do you engage them to have that conversation? So there's those two things kind of coming up of where do you already have that audience and how do you engage them? And then also just making sure that we, we're keeping it up on our website, on our social media, on our TV screens when you walk yeah. in. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a good good thing, right? Because that's a very important. Because these are, I mean, because these are SaaS or, or the cloud base and all of those solutions, right? So there's a cost doesn't increase for the library. So if you if people are using it more and more, so because these are very valuable resources, if those are made available and people become aware of them, then if based on kind of new thing that come online, uh, and, and and it would be very valuable for the community. So it's really important for us to promote those kind of more effectively. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree, Sandy. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Well, Tom, if you wanted to, to share what you were gonna share related to benchmarking and, and some of those other things, and then we can take any other questions that, that board members might have. Yeah, that sounds good. The, the benchmarking I put, in the con- the contextual piece, you know, uh, following this table, um, but just quickly, Naperville Public Library budgets for three hundred fifteen thousand dollars annually for these subscriptions, and has a population of about one hundred forty nine thousand people. Gail Borden Public Library in Elgin allocates about one hundred seventy thousand uh, dollars for databases with a population size of about one hundred fifteen thousand. So. We budgeted 200,000 for databases in 2021 and spent $121,000. And I have some reasoning in in there for the under expenditure. Some some of the reason is that we pay for uh, platform fees from other ebook vendors that we have out of this line. So that's not accounted for in the 112,000. And we give a little room in case negotiations don't go our way, but they normally go our way. Um, and, and we can we do have some room here to, to add though, that that's recognized. Um, finally, I would just say that um, two of the three highest cost per use databases that you see here, um, Candid, which is Foundation Directory Online. I mentioned that's for nonprofit organizations and community members seeking grants and, and getting fully knowledgeable and supported about how to um, apply for a grant, find out more information about what kind of grants are out there pertaining to their business. And Creative Bug, which we were just talking about, those are the high, the, those were just purchased in, in 2021. So, uh, you know, they're newer and um, it'll take us some time to maybe introduce those to the community. And also just the very nature of those databases are such that they are the weightier, kind of more comprehensive and research for the Candid Foundation directory line and those in-depth video tutorials for Creative Bug, by their nature, those sessions are, are heavier sessions than you know um, a simple address search. So just wanted to mention that too, because some of those cost per use numbers, uh, you know, you raise an eyebrow at, wanted to just touch on that there. And also I think the other part of this thing, right? Perhaps you want to add to that, uh, uh, Tom, right, is the, value per usage, right? I mean, this is the cost per of that, right? So I think what is important is I think the value per usage also is important factor for the community because eventually this is going to be delivered to the community, right? So that's important aspect to consider as well. Yeah, I really like that idea. And I, I will say, if I find a really good book on Novelist, that value for me is super high. So I don't want to discount some of these other databases uh, uh, but I really appreciate the idea of value per use. It's, it, it rings true in terms of like, how did the, how did it help the person? Yeah. 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 That's the full, sole purpose of library. Right? So. Yeah. I had one thing about the cost of these databases. Yes. So, so these database vendors figure cost by population. 
So when Tom shares that a library that has 75% of our population budgets a third more, you know, you, I think that's something we need to take into account. Um, these vendors give us ridiculously good prices because Himanshu Trivedi negotiates great deals with them. I was at a, on a call with him once with, with, um, with one of these vendors and I actually felt sorry for the vendor. I really did. So um, we, we are getting great value, you know, for the, for these databases. Um, and, um, and, and I think you're right, Sandeep, they, they, they produce a lot of value for the community as well. Yep. Other questions or comments for uh, Tom? I would just, um, you know, add that I, I recognize too that the these are resources not just for our community but for our staff and you know the staff who work at the reference desk to have authoritative sources, especially like something novelists when we are trying to connect um, readers to their next good book, something like A to Z databases to help those uh, small business owners who may come in with reference questions. Um, you know, these, I think these databases, you know, they're, it's why we talk about the library as, um, you know, in this era of disinformation, these, this is the place where you can go for authoritative um, information and these these resources, um, you know that this is what they do and, and provide. But you know, to your point, Sandeep, I, libraries I think always have been trying to do more in the way of marketing and really just help our users understand what they can get from these resources. And you know, I think we just continue continue with that aim. Yep. Okay. Well, Tom, thank you for your work and and um, and and the rest of the staff who helped put that together. Um, and um, yeah, if there's no other questions or comments, uh, I think we're going to shift now to our equity, diversity, inclusion update with uh, Miriam, who's just going to talk about staff uh, EDI work. Yeah. Um, so I cannot tell you how excited I am to be sharing all these updates. Um, as Tom said, with, with you know, putting together the, the databases, I reflected a lot on the work that we've been doing, and I'm so proud about the work that the staff have been doing and the foundation that they're really laying down for all of the great work um, moving ahead. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Um, go. Can you see my screen? Um, so a little bit of an update, um, and here's a little bit of a refresher about the pillar. Um, you might recall that in uh, July of 2020, uh, the board adapted a, a statement and um, to uh, adopt a pillar into our strategic plan, um, the pillar named Advancing Through Equity, and the statement being the library supports our community by embedding equity, diversity, and inclusion onto every facet of our organization. So statement was adopted in July, the group got together in about September, October, and then all the work that I'm going to be kind of going over is work that we've been doing since October 2020. Um, oops. All right, so one of the first goal that we had was that the library will establish a more inclusive and equitable working environment. So through our uh, reviewing our recruitment and hiring process, uh, mentorship uh, program or leadership pipeline, and then collecting internal data and feedback. So here's the update for that specific goal. Um, so we did assess all the job requirements and descriptions and pay equity within the job descriptions that have been coming up. As jobs become available, we do kind of go back and look at the minimum require requirements, descriptions, and then we did assess the pay equity there. We um, started having all of our job postings translated. So um, this is as of, again, October of 2020, we started translating any job position that became available, we translated to a Spanish platform. We expanded our posting sites. Um, so we um, created a new page. So we made the, as I said, the job postings available in Spanish. Well, we created a, space, a page in Spanish for people to find specifically job postings. Um, 
We also um, we started posting within the community. So at grocery stores, at sharing with our local partners. So being more intentional about where we were posting these, these jobs. And then also going back to historically black colleges and universities where that master's in library science was required posting through, through that platform. Um, and then we are gonna start having EDI team, um, a team member from this pillar um, at interviews to provide an EDI lens. This was a recommendation that was made by RJW, our EDI consultant, um, to provide that equitable lens, making sure that we, um, any kind of red flags that, are, are, that we see by a candidate or even within the interview process is kind of being brought up. Within that mentorship program, we created an affinity, affinity group um, for um, BIPOC staff, so Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color. Um, and we've had, we had about seven people that attended. We've only had one meeting. We started meeting in um, December. We had about seven people that attended and then about 10 to 15 that showed interest of, I can't make it to this meeting, but keep me in the loop. Um, for collecting internal data and feedback, um, we sent out a voluntary staff survey to kind of gather the demographic information. What, what does our staff kind of look like um, in, in terms of demographic information? It was completely voluntary and that was collected as well. Um, and then another thing that we embedded into our process is um, we gather feedback from staff at quarterly review with, 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 um, with all staff. So when a staff member meets with their manager on a quarterly basis, that's one question that's asked every quarter. Um, tell me about what you worked on regarding your EDI work within your position, personally, et cetera. So that's embedded into kind of every check-in that we do. So goal number two was library staff will be responsive and accountable to the diverse needs of the community, um, will evaluate community needs, develop accountability mechanisms, bring awareness of EDI pillar and the work that we're doing, and improve customer service experience. So what we've done here, um, we've evaluated the community needs and we, that's an ongoing kind of work. We don't think that it's gonna be a one and done. This is the findings that we have and we're never gonna go back and get any community feedback. We are kind of embedding this throughout various departments and the work that we're doing. So for example, we have a task group, which is our Hispanic engagement group that was created. Um, that's a big demographic within Aurora. And we wanted to make sure that we're focusing um, on what does the Hispanic community need from the library? So that's one group where we're doing community conversations. Another um, department that's doing this is the outreach services department. So reaching out to community members, seeing what they'd like to uh, see within the bookmobile. Speaking for myself as well, um, within the communications department, we're reaching out to individual folks about what communication they'd like to get from the library, from the moment that they sign up for the library card to why haven't they signed up to their library card to long-term library card holders. So we're, we're continuing to have those community conversations really throughout many departments, not just you know, it's coming from the EDI pillar group. It's kind of scattered throughout. Um, we've developed accountability mechanisms in that we've had um, staff and board training. I know that you all completed two trainings as well as our supervisors or managers completed um, uh, four trainings and then our staff completed two trainings as well. Um, as I said earlier, another accountability mechanism is those quarterly performance reviews. Um, so just the consistency of making sure that it, it, people are being intentional and that EDI work is, is present in the work that they're doing day in and day out. And then um, uh, tracking minority owned businesses, that's something that we started doing as well, uh, or that we're gonna start doing um, is tracking who are we hiring that is a minority um, owner of a business that we're, that we're interacting with. So that's another thing that we're tracking. Um, other things within accountability mechanisms that, um, sorry, I, I skipped this one little thing. Um, accountability mechanisms is some managers are making sure that it's, it's conversations that they're having with their staff members. So for example, our, um, our collection services have monthly EDI discussions with their staff. Our children's department had a book discussion with their staff members. So other managers are also finding ways to infuse this um, and making sure that they're holding their staff accountable. Um, improving the customer service experience. So um, you all were part of the policy audits um, and making sure that we went fine free as a library, implementing those forever cards. And that of course goes into having a positive customer service experience. 
Um, we also had a communication audit that was as uh, that was a part of the um, work with a consultant um, in which they went through all of our communication um, channels and gave us feedback as to what what kind of practice we can have that will have be more inclusive in the visuals that we have in social media as well as an in person experience. Um, another thing that we had was, uh, or that we're working on right now, um, is making sure that our Spanish collections being moved. So right now at Santori, it's on the third floor. Well, let's make it more accessible, move it to the second floor and have it be more up front and center. And then the other thing that, um, it, that was upgraded or, or um, improved was our banning process. So um, within our, um, our banning process, the sleeping, there was a, a, a banning process for if you slept in the library. So that was re removed from the list. And of course, that made it a lot better. Um, now we try and offer a community resource paper for those that um, if they do get banned, here's a, a resource, um, depending on where we see fit. And then overall, um, the training has really helped in terms of trying to identify inherent bias. And that's unfortunately something that I can't really give you a statistic on or anything like that. But intentionality, um, that's something that with customer service and their experience that customers are coming in, that's going to be a domino effect of um, procedures changing, programs changing, et cetera, re resulting in a, in a much better customer experience. All right, the third goal was um, the library will ensure our services and resources represent a diversity of cultures and perspectives. And this is kind of a breakdown of the library as a whole, so like program, through programming, through services, and our collection. So here's our update. Um, we are currently working on a programming audit um, to gather information about who we're hiring as presenters, what kind of programs are we offering, are they own voices, so is someone who is speaking about that topic of that culture or that demographic or that background. Um, also auditing, are the programs culturally appropriate? Um, so we're doing a programming audit as a whole. The children specifically, the children's department is doing specifically another audit to kind of look at what kind of stories are we reading to kids? What kind of book lists are we providing? And then um, you heard from um, Himanshu at the digital services report. They did a market research as to what needs to still need to be met and develop the programs based off of those needs. Um, I will say that um, with the um, with intentionality, this is something again more of an anecdote than a statistic. Um, I've heard a lot of programmers say, "I'm just being more mindful about what kind of programs I'm providing for customers, what kind of handouts I'm handing out to them." So just that intentional intentionality that staff are that are having as they put together the programs is just it's huge. Um, statistically, um, for 2021 and 2022, 31% of our programs fell into this EDI um, kind of um, bucket, essentially is what we're calling them. Our programming audit will be very using similar factors to what our collection audit will be just for consistency. So that's kind of where we got the 31% um, within, that, the, uh, within those programs. Within services, we expanded um, our services or our portfolio, I guess, our services um, within our portfolio. So that's being, um, I'm not sure if you all saw that we um, are providing parking lot Wi-Fi. Um, so we obviously always offered internet access, but now we provide them 24 seven in our parking lots at all three locations. And then the other thing that we're offering is um, we have an intern, a social services intern, and she's providing some um, social services um, meetings um, on Wednesday Says that we're publicizing for the public and for our staff as well. So that's another thing that was added to our portfolio. Um, we're just making sure, honestly, the other thing with intentionality is making things more accessible. Um, looking at meeting room costs for nonprofits to make sure that they're more accessible to nonprofits, making sure that our library card applications more streamlined and easy for people to get a library card, and making sure that our library card process our applications is available in multiple languages. Um, that's another one that we're doing. Um, and then other services um, that we're expanding or, or that we're making sure that are more accessible are um, we have a book match program, we have an adult book boxes, um, we have a proposal for, for customers to submit, hey, I want to see this program come to the library. All of those services were not available in Spanish, so we're making sure that um, not only are we promoting them um, in our Spanish platforms, but that we're going back and seeing them, making sure that the procedure is also available in Spanish as well. 
And then the other thing within our services is that representation matters. This is something that we're seeing as we're um, recommending and doing readers advisory, making sure that our book list, that our staff picks that we're doing, that they promote a, a diverse array of um, authors, topics, who's, who's in the stories, who's in the movies, who's, who's being represented. So making sure that that representation is, is there. And then lastly, within this will be um, our collection audits. We, um, our collection services staff um, took a training in the summer of 2021, and they're gonna start training other staff to start completing the audit um, right around March of 2022 of this year. So that's kind of been in the long works, but it's, it's um, we kind of needed to get that training ready to go before we, um, we get our staff rolling within that. Um, the other thing within our collection is our, our world language, our world collection um, is, is, is growing. Um, it's 7% of our collection right now. And for 2022, it, it was allocated about 13% of the budget for uh, collection services. And lastly, um, one of the biggest um, things that we had within our collection services um, was the limit, the limit of vendors that we had. So now we've expanded to eight new vendors to kind of help grow within grow that world collection that we have. All right, and then moving forward. So we want to make sure that we train our new staff. Um, as I, I spoke earlier about you all, the, the, uh, the board, the staff, the managers, et cetera, took a, uh, a training. So we wanna make sure that um, as new staff come in, that they're having this training as well to kind of develop that common language and that commitment to EDI that, that APLD has. Um, we'll continue the process into 2022 and beyond. Um, the process meaning, as I said, like we're getting started with our collection audit, for example. So continuing that process into this year and then continue to practice the knowledge that we gain within these trainings and practice that we've learned as to audits, as to um, how to deal with conflict, how to make sure that procedure is equitable. Um, so making sure that it's embedded in that. And then more importantly, we have a new strategic plan coming up. So making sure that we kind of keep this EDI lens as we move forward within our strategic plan. And that's it, folks. Quick, I know, but if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right, let's let Miriam take a breath here. <laughs> she has a lot, <laughs> a lot to share, which is a good thing. Yes, but, it was um, a lot. Are there any uh, questions or comments for Miriam? Uh, Miriam, I think just a quick comment. It's a, it's a great work, uh, great progress, all of that, right? Uh, you, you have a lot of good stories and good anecdotes there. Uh, I'm not sure kind of, and some of these are very difficult to quantify, but I think it's uh, sometimes helpful to uh, kind of define the quanti kind of create a quantification so they can yep. train the trajectory of that, right? For example, the customer satisfaction and things like that that you mentioned. If there's a way to say, kind of CSAT customer satisfaction was X kind of percentage, and now the next quarter or next year or next mm -hmm. six months, it has gone from kind of what X was there to Y. And I think that that kind of helps see the progress Yep. Right. Um, so I think if there's anything that you could do around those dimensions, not everything would be possible because yep. there's a lot of it's a qualitative aspect to that. But yep. if it is possible, uh, that would be helpful because then it provides you a clear dashboard of the progress on the program. For sure. Yep. That's an excellent suggestion, Sandy. Thank you. I was just going to mention one thing around that. Um, Heather and I have been working with our supervisors and managers recently to develop um, outcomes-based awareness and understanding for when we plan programs and services. So the outcomes are what changed for that person after they received this program or participated in this program or used a service. And we're getting close to finalizing a, an online survey and a paper survey that also Miriam helped us with. So that targeted programs, we can, sh we can share this survey with customers to say, hey, did your life change? How did it change? Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think? So that yeah. is one way. I know what you suggested is 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 pretty far reaching, and that's good. But that's just one way we're thinking about that moving forward. So I wanted to mention that too. Yeah, I mean that that's great because those are kind of incremental things, right? Those yeah. are kind of keep adding up, and then you can have a bigger impact. So anything that we could do to say, hey, kind of here is the service being provided. 
this change kind of uh, for the individual, their satisfaction improved, or whatever that may be. Some of it may be qualitative, some of it may be quantitative, and, and it helps get a better context as to what change has been um, kind of facilitated and, and injected uh, through, through the efforts. Um, uh, oh, go ahead, Suzanne. All right, thank you. Um, so Miriam, thank you very much. Uh, it was very um, interesting and you may or may not know that the board recently went through um, uh, EDI training as mm -hmm. well. So we just um, completed um, our EDI sessions. Um, and I, I think I'd just like to say that um, I look forward to um, continuing to support you and the library in this work. I think it's really important. Um, and I'm specifically thinking about uh, goal two, um, bring awareness of the EDI pillar. Yep. Um, that's uh, absolutely on my mind as um, we think about uh, the strategic plan in the mm -hmm. future and yep. how that can be supported by um, by this body as well. Yep. Thank you, Suzanne. That means a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> um, one of the things that, and we had talked about this in an early meeting, um, it involves like the, the bookmobile and, and getting it into communities that aren't being served um, by the library. I don't recall if you went over, if there was anything that you talked about or if there was anything um, under this umbrella that in that regard. Um, so we did do community conversations and that I know that that's something that Jessica's department has worked on. I, Heather, I know that you're on here. I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more about that piece specifically. And honestly, Paul, I wanted to keep it short and concise. I missed so much <laughs> other stuff that we're doing, but I'm like, quick. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> There's been a lot for sure. We have had conversations as far as what the new bookmobile should include. And, um, we incorporated that feedback into the design for the interior for the new bookmobile. We're getting ready to start another round of sort of feedback on design related to the exterior of the bookmobile. And then Jessica Cantorero, the, the manager of outreach services and I have been talking about, you know, starting to work on um, kind of a rubric that staff can use when they are deciding where to take the bookmobile and who we're gonna serve. I mean, we wanna serve everybody, but we have some limitations on staff and, and just time of day, how much we can be out in the community. So trying to make sure we're hitting all those places and having a way to sort of um, show that because the staff already do take that into account. It's just not done right now in a way that is easy to explain, I think, to maybe someone who doesn't work in their department. So an ongoing process for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Maybe we just need another bookmobile. Laura, can you get on that? Uh, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I go for that, Laura. <laughs> Any other questions or comments for Miriam? I just had uh, one comment or, or perhaps a question. Um, you know, I, I think it's you know, related to staff training um, and, you know, just, just, you know, customer service and sort of embodying these principles. I, I think it's really important that, you know, our contract security staff have, I, you know, I don't know the extent that they can be involved with our training or what expectations we have, but, you know, they're, um, you it's really important that the policies that they enforce um, in their role as like security um, embodies our, our vision for equitable service because, you know, we can't just say, well, they're not, you know, they're contracts that they are the library uh, to people that enter uh, our facility each day. So I, I just, I hope that that's something that we take into uh, consideration in whatever way we can. But that's an important point, Joe, right? because I think many times they are the first people who yeah. the patrons are seeing, right? So it's important that. You know. Yeah. I, I want to just respond to that real quick, Joe, because it, we're in this strange spot where the security guards are right at the door right now, you know, and it's not something we would ever do. 
have the first person you see there being a security guard and, you know, but they have been pivotal for us in making sure that masks are staying on for people coming in the door. But I, I will say, I appreciate, you know, what you mentioned there. And that's something that Michaela and I just today talked about, you know, what, what training opportunities we can have for that, that part of our, our staff, they really are, that um, can support them in making sure that, you know, people feel welcome here when they also interact with our security. And even if there's a point of contention that they're treated with respect in that instance. So thank you for mentioning that. Any final comments or questions for Miriam? Well, if not, I think it's a, you know, an impressive list of, of accomplishments, things that we doing and can, you know, have done and continue to do and all kind of during a pandemic. So kudos to all the staff and certainly Miriam for your leadership on the EDI committee. Um, a, lot of, a lot of great work has been done. So thank you. And thank you for the update this evening. Okay, that brings us to final item adjournment. So there being no further business before the board, may I have a motion and a second to adjourn this meeting at 7.36 p.m.? Motion. Second. Okay, motion carries and we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. We need to Stay take a, we need to take a Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> I and got also, so close. So <laughs> close. I, I didn't hear who was the, who moved to adjourn. Oh, that was me, Paul. Oh, thank you, Paul. Okay. Uh, All right. Now we can go on. Uh, Suzanne, if you could please call the roll one last time. Okay. Ryan Citron? Yes. All right. Joe Filipek? Yes. Paul Latour? Yes. Sandeep Lande? Yes. Matthew Orr? Yes. Melinda Riddick? Yes. And Suzanne Stegeman? Yes. All right. With that, the motion carries and we are now adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Stay warm as if that was possible. <laughs> it's, it's, it's warm enough. It's got a, we've got a heat wave going now. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Thanks, right. everyone. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Good evening. Thank you. Have a good, good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.